Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practice Show. We take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And today, we are going to examine one of the most controversial topics in all of great restorative dentistry. Should GPs place implants with the guy who explains this better than anybody, my good friend, Dr. John Cranham. Don't miss this. Grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Best Practice Show. Welcome back. We are having so much fun and the viewers, uh, and I'm thanking all of you for all the shares. This is crazy how much fun we're having. So, uh, and getting a lot of great feedback about stuff you want to see. And today is no exception. So we're going to fly right into the eye of the storm. You don't want to miss this conversation. Uh, but a couple of show notes. Here's what I'm going to say. We are shooting this episode live on Facebook. So if you're watching this live, do me a favor, ask a question right in the feed and I'll ask uh, John directly and we'll get the answers straight from the top on this because I know you're going to want to ask questions on this one. Uh, and then also, we just love the question so much. Every week we give away a free Apple iWatch and two tickets to our practice growth seminar called Activate just because I love the questions and the questions get better and better every single week. So please keep asking them. Now, on this particular episode, I'm going to just say this. Um, I am a huge fan of high-quality, restorative, interdisciplinary dentistry. If you watch the show, you already know that. I just love when people do amazing stuff together. And uh, the question I get, I get this question, I'm not kidding, several times a week. Should GPs place implants? Should they not? I have so many of my dear friends that are Seattle Study Club directors and um, you know periodontists, oral surgeons, they place and they just do incredible stuff. And so they're seeing this trend, we're seeing this trend, let's talk about the trend. And I've got my good buddy, Dr. John Cranham from the DOS Academy. Now I'm gonna introduce him myself and then I'm gonna have, have him share his story. Uh, in 2005, as my, um, you know, Pete Dawson was always an incredible mentor of mine. And then in 2005, I uh, flew up to Traverse City, Michigan, and I just made a decision that I was going to have a good friend who would mentor me. And, uh, you know, hope it worked out for me. I, I told you you were going to mentor me and you were like, I'll decide that. And so uh, you've been a great clinical uh, friend and mentor. And just I've learned so much in the thing. I'm going to say this about you. The thing I love about you is you do love to walk that line. And it's not because for any other reason, it's happening all the time. You see every industry, especially this industry that we care about so much, it's changing. It changes all the time. And so I want to talk about that. Uh, but before we do, just tell us your story. For If, if anyone doesn't know who Dr. John Cranham is, who is Dr. Cranham? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I guess I'm a, a, a dentist that's almost 30 years in now. Um, heard Pete Dawson six months out of dental school and was blessed enough to get uh, my tuition paid by a le local lab guy to, to send me down there. Um, heard him, went through his courses twice in two years and then started chasing around some of the cosmetic guys back there in the early 90s. And what happened to me was about 95, 96 um, it occurred to me that integrating some of the traditional approaches to occlusion with the emerging uh, cosmetic dentistry, um, the things that were happening in cosmetic dentistry make sense. And for those of, that are new, don't, don't, it's hard to imagine, but they were sort of diametrically opposed at that time. And I created a lecture called the Cosmetic Occlusal Connection, which um, got me going around the country that was, again, controversial at the time, walking the line, as you say. Um, but then in 03, uh, got scouted by Dr. Dawson, and, and he invited me to come in and uh, became the clinical director and one of the owners in 07, and, and I'm still one of the leaders and involved with a, a lot of the lectures and hands-on and and going all over lecturing, but still in my practice three days a week doing the best dentistry I know how to do. So it's, yeah. a, it's been an amazing uh, journey for sure. Yeah, and if you haven't heard of the Dawson Academy, you got to go. I was just down there with you guys at the alumni uh, event, which was just an incredible weekend. And you have, you're not just in 
Florida anymore. I mean, you guys are all over all the, the world. world. Yeah. Japan, India, China. Um, mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, so it's great. Mm -hmm. Check it out. So, so let's talk about this. Let's go right there. Why is this such a hot topic? Why? Well, I do think that, um, you know, everybody, I think there is a little bit of turf, a little bit of a turf war going on. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that one of the things to, that I think about that's hard to imagine, but um, back in the sort of late 50s and, and early 60s, um, it was kind of controversial for general dentists to do crowns. You know, they were sort of done by prosthodontists at the time and, and dentists were there to fill teeth and clean teeth and, and do the nuts and bolts. And I do think as things have evolved, um, the training that general dentists are exposed to have, have expanded. Right. Having said that though, I, I do think that when we look at the, the, the whole spectrum of, of implantology and doing implant surgery, uh, with the technology we have today, there are certain surgeries that are very, very simple, and there mm -hmm. are certain surgeries that are extremely complex. And right. so, like anything, uh, a little bit later, we'll talk about this concept of the green, yellow, red, which I think every dentist should be thinking about with any procedure they do, whether mm -hmm. they're taking a tooth out or doing a crown or a root canal. I mean, we, we face it all the time. We need to know what our sweet spot is in our practice, where, where we're capable of, because the minute we we delve into something like an extraction or a root canal or placing an implant, we have to remember we are held to the standard of the specialist. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to go down this road, uh, we can do it. Uh, you know, for me, my training, I had training early in the 90s uh, by, by Dr. Mish, uh, and I did, went and did some of that training. And and there was a guy in the Orlando area named uh, Tom Ford who uh, who spoke with Mike with with, with Picos uh, Mike Picos mm -hmm. at the time, and I went down there and took their classes. Uh, Tom was interesting because he went to the same high school I did in in Grand Rapids, Michigan. His uncle was was Jerry Ford, who was the president, mm -hmm. um, and so our families knew each other. And so I I was intrigued by. First, certainly the prosthetic aspects of it, and then I got intrigued by the surgical part of it. In the early 90s, though, there was no cone beam, so it was very unpredictable in terms of you didn't know what the bone was going to be until mm -hmm. you got in there. And uh, I'll talk a little bit later. Uh, for me, uh, getting a cone beam in my practice, primarily for, for looking at joints, uh, once I had a cone beam in and started doing some of the treatment planning aspects of it, uh, it made me want to revisit uh, some of the, some of the surgeries. Um, but, but I get it's controversial. Uh, I also feel like, uh, for me in the, the dentist that we see, particularly the young dentist that we see, there are so many young dentists that are drawn to it. Mm -hmm. And my greatest concern is, um, imp dentists learning to place implants before they really know where the tooth is going to go. Right. And so to me, implant surgery is such a prosthodontically driven thing that, um, that there's just a lot to it beyond just the mm -hmm. surgical technique. Uh, it has to be done in a way that we three-dimensionally visualize where things are. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's it. Um, yeah. I, I do think that uh, if, if, we, if we think about why implant surgery uh, uh, is something that, you know, why would we implement something like, like implant surgery, which if we go to slide one, we can take a look at that. Um, there's sort of five things that I think about uh, that sort of drew me to it. And, and the first thing is, is that, you know, I have a, a, a remarkable interdisciplinary team that I work with, um, mm -hmm. orthodontist, a couple of orthodontists, a, a surgeon, um, as well as an periodontist, which I'll talk about later, which I probably learn more about implants from him than maybe than anybody, but but some of the basic surgeries that we're capable of doing has actually made me a much more valuable member of the interdisciplinary team because I right. understand sort of limitations sometimes. I, I'm recognizing the areas that are more simple and the areas preclinically that are going to be more difficult to manage. Um, mm -hmm. I do think when we're developing a practice and, and doing uh, procedures, uh, there isn't any questions that people like to have their services done in one place if they can. I mean, they have their relationships primarily with us and people are busier. 
so the fact that they can have their diagnostics and their plan and the, the treatment done in one, one place is attractive if the care is going to be as good. And that's, mm-hmm. the, that's the key. Um, it sometimes can give the restorative dentist greater control in terms of if, if you're removing a tooth or um, if it's an immediate placement and you're making a, a custom impression coping, you're really trying to control the tissues that can sometimes occur. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly going to add a revenue stream to the practice that may be not there, which I think drives a lot of it. But I tell you, for me, <laughs> the biggest thing that, that, that drew me to it is, and I think you, you chuckled about this when I presented this at the, um, at the alumni meeting, but but we talked about as as dentists, we go through these levels of imp, of implementing new things, and and we start at sort of the level of being unconsciously incompetent when we're bad and we don't even know we're bad, and then we become consciously incompetent, and then we get consciously competent. If we keep going, we become unconsciously competent. That means we're good at it, and we don't even have to think about it. And, right. and one of the things, at least in my personality type, if everything that I do is at the level of unconsciously competent, competent level, it, it sounds like it would be great, but it can start to become boring. Mm-hmm. And, and I love, I, I freaking love to be at that level where I'm good at something, but I really have to think about it. You know, right. implant surgery gets my heart rate up and, and it gets me excited and it stretches me. And so, you know, it allows me to plan. So even if, if I'm not going to put the implant in, I'm still the one three-dimensionally visualizing where it go and making the guide. Um, but, but I love how it stretches us and, and the simpler ones, maybe a uh, couple of months, five to six, seven months we'll put in the rest. We go out. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of why. Yeah. And can you talk about this trend too, because I've seen this for years And this isn't just about how good you get. You've told me this over and over again. You know, your vision at the Dawson Academy is make sure you guys are in the front end of what's what what thinking is going on in dentistry. So you guys have seen this for years. This is not new. Uh, I saw it back way before 2010. A lot of the specialists I were. I was working with uh, and still work with today, they're like, oh, me and my GPs are starting to place implants. Now, you can go one of two ways. You can go off the deep end and get angry, or you can say, hey, look, it's a trend and um, embracing the actual trend. And you guys saw this at the Dawson Academy, correct? Yeah. And it, and it's the same with ortho. It's the same with, um, I mean, I remember that 10 years ago, everybody thought that chair side CAD cam, if you, if you were milling chair side, that all that dentistry was terrible. It didn't mm-hmm. actually go to a lab. Um, people are shocked that we mill some crowns on our office, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so I, I'm a big believer in embracing technology. If it's going to be, if it's going to add some sort of increased predictability, increased efficiency, and increased profitability to the bottom line. That's that PEP thing we talked about last time. Right. And and I certainly think there are some technologies that when we when we start looking at that don't don't really mm-hmm. help that. Um, but the question is as as this sort of this concept of the super generalist, and that's really what we're talking about. This concept right. of a of a general dentist who keeps up one hundred percent of everything in house. That's not what we're talking about here mm-hmm. at all. What right. we're talking about is a general dentist who becomes extremely knowledgeable and uh, expands and grows and and develops great clinical techniques and dev- and and develops a way to know where certain things should happen. And mm-hmm. part of that, uh, part of that responsibility is certainly to develop the relationships with the team, understand when absolutely a team is going to be needed. But, uh, you know, I've found with my specialist, I don't see them incredibly intimidated by my, um, implant surgical skill because, right. because they know that I'm going to pick the ones that have great bone and great attached tissue and are going to be fairly easy for me to do. Mostly guided, uh, some right. a lot of times flapless. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But yeah. but I but I think that the, the, the concern is, and the concern is legitimate, um, and your point I think you're alluding it to is um, like anything. It's the same thing as for the person who buys the CERAC, and now every time they do a CERAC, 100% of their crowns are being made by the CERAC. 
Mm-hmm. Well, a Sarek is not a hundred percent thing. It's a sometimes thing. And right. I've made some incredibly beautiful crowns with my Sarek machine on good stable occlusions and uh, good preparation design and, and scanning. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I certainly think along with orthodontics, uh, Invisalign by a GP can be mm-hmm. very, very successful in the right cases. The key is to know when it's appropriate and when it's not. Yeah. So let's examine that question because that was my next question. When and when to not? You know, let's say I'm in, let's speak to the young, maybe the young practitioner might, might be watching this who's maybe 32 getting started. How would you answer that question? Well, let's talk about what I what I want to do is maybe take you on a little journey here. Okay. And I think maybe the way to think about it is how the heck did I get to this point where at really it's probably been about six years. So at about 48 years old, all of a sudden I thought hmm, I'm going to start placing implants. You know, that mm-hmm. was sort of a wild thing because in my practice, I had become so interdisciplinary driven. I, I wasn't even taking out a lot of teeth. I mean, I did some aesthetic crown lengthening and was comfortable laying flaps to raise the tissue levels on, again, on the simpler ones, but a lot of them went out to the periodontist. And so mm-hmm. let's look at sort of the, the steps that we went through, and then maybe you can kick around questions uh, back and forth off of that, and we can kind of go through some slides here. Love and, it. Uh, and use the slide technique that you're excited yeah. about. So. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't done this before. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. So if we, if we go to slide two, let's, let's look at steps to implementing implant surgery as a GP. And the first thing that we talk about is that to master the treatment planning and restorative protocols for implant services. So what we mean by that is that we, and and again, it sounds like, yeah, yeah, master, you know, it sounds like an easy thing, but you know, the one thing for me that I look at it is I spent literally the first 20 years of my life as a dentist, really understanding, um, where teeth go from an aesthetic and functional perspective. So, uh, you know, designing cases that were going to be beautiful, but also stable occlusally. And so that means learning how to evaluate photographs and mounted models and centric relation. And so I felt like as I started to study more about implants, that a lot of that training really helped me because the first step in figuring out where an implant's going to go and whether you should do it is to first figure out where the tooth should be and then have a way to figure out where the implant should be. And then the third thing is to understand some of the biologic differences between implants and teeth because it absolutely affects our outcome. So if we can go to slide three for a second, one of the one of the real simpler things to understand is that if we look at the soft tissues of teeth, and, and these are these happen to be veneers that I place, so it's all natural teeth, but I'm sort of simulating the difference between implants and teeth. That the when we have all teeth present, the scallop of the underlying bone is going to be flatter than the scallop of the overlying tissue. So interproximally, if you have a papilla that touches the contact point, there's essentially a five millimeter space from the contact point to the interproximal bone. And then straight facially, it's going to be about three millimeters uh, on average. When you start putting an implant in, we need to have the head of that implant about three to four millimeters from the free gingival margin but the scallop of the bone is going to be less. So from our contact point to the interproximal bone, you're only going to have a dimension of about four millimeters. And then we have two implants next to each other, that scallop decreases even more. So the papilla is going to be less pointy and it's going to be about three millimeters from the bone. So one of the things that's important about a lot of this research is the understanding that we think a lot about the buccal lingual position of where the implant should be, so it's in bone, but what we forget a lot about is how deep the implant needs to be. And so we can only plan how deep the implant needs to be if we first figure out where we want our incisal edge, where we want our gum tissue, and then from there how deep the implant needs to go. And I don't know any other way to treatment plan this other than to carefully look at it on my mounted models and on my photographs and then relate that information to the cone beam. And so this really sets us, sets us up well. So if we go to uh, slide number four there, um, what we're talking about then is that 
we need to first sort of visualize where our cuss tip or incisal edge alleged going to be. Then we need to visualize where the free gingival margin is going to be. And then we can figure out how deep we need the implant. And, and this basic little parameter here is what um, was taught to me over and over again uh, by working with my periodontist. And so, mm -hmm. so with that, I think that it's important for us to recognize that specialists, the better specialists, uh, really get this. Al Konikoff is the periodontist that I've used for years. Um, we did a lot of cases, crown lengthening cases and grafting cases. And quite frankly, when we started doing implants together, a lot of this content with, was in his head. And what he did for a lot of us as GPs is we would send him the implant. He would figure all this out, put the implant in, put in a custom healing button, mature the tissues, and then tell us it was ready for an impression. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really realize how spoiled we are. <laughs> So right. as time went on and we started to meet, you know, we used to have those little interdisciplinary meetings every month and I started to watch what he was doing. That's where a lot of this learning came for me was doing mm -hmm. cases with him and, and really getting clear on that. So let, let me look at slide uh, five there for a second and, and show you a, a really early case that we did. This goes all the way back to 97. Okay. Uh, tooth number nine is extracted here. Um, thick periotype. Um, patient lost nine, had a bad post in it. We were going to do veneers all the way across before we recognized that the tooth was a failure, was, was going to fail um, restoratively. And so I sent her over to Albert. And what Albert did in this case was essentially put in the implant, put in a cover screw, and then used a flipper and contoured the bottom of the flipper to shape the tissue. Now, I didn't know what he was doing, but what he was doing was he was creating a vehicle to protect those papillae from collapsing. And, and again, we did have the thick, thicker parotype to help us, um, but you can see that the tissues look pretty good. We go to slide six. This is the 14-day post-op after me putting my veneers in and my crown. And what you'll notice here is just a teeny tiny black triangle between eight and nine. Now, what we didn't know at this time was that implants are different than teeth. I put my contact point exactly five millimeters from bone, and it should have grown in if those were two teeth. And so it was shortly after this that some of Tarnow's work came out that showed us the differences between implants and teeth. Today, we would make that contact point up a little higher. Um, Albert did everything right. I maybe was a little, uh, a little slow restoratively here. But look what happens at six months. At six months, we go to the next slide, slide seven. It completely fills in. And mm. the only thing that I can tell you is, is, is it wasn't because we added porcelain. We just got lucky. This is a patient that had a thicker than normal periotype. But it was this case that while we were doing it, that he was reading some of the perio literature and we started changing some of the dimensions. And I started really understanding that when we take teeth out, we have to support those papilla. We have to do whatever we're going to need to do, whether it's with a provisional or a custom healing abutment or something to support those papilla. Albert taught me that preserving dental aesthetics is much more predictable than recreating dental aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So if those papilla are beautiful, let's preserve them at all costs. The other thing we learned is, is from him along the way, if we go to slide eight, um, is that when we place these implants in to not obliterate the socket. Um, way back, and I can't remember the date, but Albert and I published an article in the 90s, and it was on immediate load implants, which was, just, was thought of as a wild concept then. And so we were using a free light implant. We took the implant out. We put or took the tooth out, put the implant in, and obliterated the socket, and then he went through all his gymnastics. And at the end, we have this really beautiful crown in place. But when you look closely at the pictures, you see just a teeny bit of blue through the tissues. And 
what I learned from writing that article is that when you write things, you preserve your ignorance for your prosperity. <laughs> because, of course, what we know now is you don't obliterate the socket. And, and so we started putting in narrower implants, more to the palatal, and, and actually leaving a gap like we're showing here uh, to allow that bone to fill in. And, you know, but watching him make provisionals, uh, and this is a great case because this is a case where he literally puts on an abutment on the crown. And if you go to the next slide, basically uses the patient's tooth, uh, reams out the inside of the tooth and, and picks up the abutment right on the implant. Okay. That makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and then as you look further down, like you're a big protocol guy. Um, I want to get into how you think in this whole process now, as, as you've taken all this learning, you put this all together. Um, tell us about that, the steps and the protocol and just how you, how you think about this now. So, and, and again, I, I, the way I look at it, the reason I think that the, our students, the people that go through Dawson are so ready to do implants is I feel like we teach them to do the hardest part, which is to go through all the normal dental examination stuff that they've trained to do to dental school, but then also add layers to it of taking a series of photographs, being able to put it into our Dawson Diagnostic Wizard to first visualize aesthetically where the teeth and the tissues should be, um, take that data, and then to be able to put it on mounted cast so that we can develop a good occlusal design. And if we do those two things, the only thing that remains is then to take a cone beam. Mm -hmm. And if we can relate the tooth position to a good um, implant position three-dimensionally, well, now we have the, the protocols to do guided surgery. And that's really what I'm going to. Um, if we go to, to slide 10 here, uh, the second thing that in the steps to implementing implant surgery as a GP is to master a protocol to control implant placement. And that means designing your own surgical guides based on optimum tooth position. So again, if we go to slide 11, this is just a, a nice example, very simple, simplistic example on a cone beam of what we can see. Uh, patients missing an incisor, we can basically um, fabricate a tooth from our models that, uh, uh, that verifies where we would like it to be from incised ledge to free gingival margin. Um, we can scan the patient with a radiopaque version of that tooth in place, and then we can put the implant in. Now, this is, I, I have the Serona product in my office, so we have the Galileos, and we have the, um, the capacity to, uh, to do enteral scans. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But but the bottom line is, however you do it, you just have to master a protocol. One of the more interesting companies right now, actually a guy that would be interesting for you to have on is, uh, is Brett, who's the owner of a company called Implant Concierge, okay. which is a pretty amazing, um, amazing company from the standpoint that it, 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 it has a, uh, a way for you to send models to them or internal scans to them and a cone beam. And then they can do all of this stuff. They can merge the data and then you can get online and position the tooth and position the implant and they can make the guides for you at a very reasonable price. So it basically holds your hand through the process of, of figuring out all this stuff, whether it's mm -hmm. a single tooth all the way up to more of an all on four, all on five type situation. Um, I don't care what method you go to. The key is first figuring out where the tooth's going to be from a size ledge to free gingival margin, and then figuring out where the implant's going to go, buckle lingually in depth. And if you notice on this picture how we can clearly see where the facial margin of our restoration is going to be, that allows us then to measure from that facial margin to the bone. And that way I can determine whether we have to add bone, whether we have to take away bone, or if the bone's in a great spot, whether we can just do it guided, or we mm -hmm. don't even have to flap it, flapless surgery, which you can do flapless surgery on a patient. I mean, honestly, the patient doesn't even know anything's been done. I mean, mm -hmm. they don't even take a Motrin afterwards. Um, but that's, that's sort of the deal. I mean, if we can kind of visualize that, that's what we're talking about. And so I think that just like everything, whether we're talking about orthodontics, veneer cases, implant cases, 
where I see dentist skimping mm -hmm. is on the planning. They're, mm -hmm. they're too quick to get in there and putting the implant in or prepping the case for the veneers. There's not enough aesthetic and occlusal design up front to get crystal clear on where we're going. And with implants, I think it's even doubly important because once that sucker's integrated, you know, you're mm -hmm. living with it. And yeah. uh, if we've all been practicing for long enough to know that, that we've had to live with a poorly placed implant and it's hard to recover from it. Right. Right. And, and sometimes, I mean, you see this too, the motivation for doing this is just wrong. It's purely financial. I mean, what you're talking about is just the learning. It's always in the best interest of the patient and um, staying within your scope of what you do really well. Now, what are some of the pitfalls? Like if I'm watching this, I think it's a great idea, but what are the things you would just some warning signs that you would say on both sides, either specialist or GP? I think I can speak better maybe from the GP because that's what, what I am. But I, I think yeah. from the, the GP side, um, I, I think that the most important thing is to, is to be conservative on when you think you should be doing it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you're going to be referring more out than you do for sure in the right. beginning. I mean, you're going to be convert. Con and I always sort of think even at, at my level where I've done a lot of implants, I'm still probably only doing 30 to 40%. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still referring much more than I'm doing. Um, so, so I, I think that you, know, you hit the nail on the head. If we're doing anything to a patient because of the dollars that are coming from the procedure solely, then we have to rethink that. Right. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that, um, you know, great dentistry dollars are going to be a byproduct of that. And so mm -hmm. if you can look at a procedure and you can visualize it and you feel like you can do it as good as your specialist then have at it. Mm -hmm. And then I think from a specialist perspective, um, I think the specialists that are a little bit more open to some of the trends that are happening and actually can be a help to to a general practitioner you know what i find is that orthodontists that help gps do some of their own tooth movement whether it's with um, an essex aligner or with its invisalign dentists who get focused on moving teeth refer more ortho they start doing mm -hmm. more ortho it becomes part of what they see day in and day mm -hmm. out and if you can help them see the, the, the time that they can do it and the time that they're going to need help, I think everybody wins. And I think it's the same thing with implant surgery. Yeah. And I think, uh, I love what you're saying. And you, you shared with me a long time ago, how your orthodontist really created a whole lot of value for you yeah. once you started going on this path and you're like, Oh my gosh, I wouldn't even try to do what you're doing, but yet having a very transparent conversation among both. And I think one of the trends you could probably speak to this is not having the conversation and then the relationship deteriorates. I'll, I'll just, I want to say this, you know, the reason you work with a great specialist isn't so much, it's not, uh, procedure specific. It's a trust collaborative experience that makes it all better for the patient. And one of my favorite, uh, Gene Ranieri, who's a surgeon, uh, he says this one, my GPs place implants. You know what I say? Let me help you. You know, like, let me come over. I'll do it at the end of the day. I'll watch you. I'll help you so that you don't get yourself in trouble. And inevitably every one of them say he's the coolest guy ever because I wouldn't attempt what he does. And I also know when I'm going to get outside of my scope and get in trouble. So it's important to have this conversation instead of not having the conversation. Would you agree? Yeah. And, and, and again, I, I also think that if you're, if you're having the, if you're having uh, conversations with patient, uh, with a specialist, you know, we, we don't meet as much as we used to, but for years we met once a month for an hour and a half, mm -hmm. you know, my specialist, my orthodontist surgeon, periodontist, and, and we really developed our protocols with working one another. Um, the more that I learned to think like a master orthodontist or a master periodontist or a master surgeon didn't necessarily mean that I had all the skills, but I did know how they were thinking. Right. And so, so uh, my point is, is that you don't want to have the conversation when you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. If you're right. thinking about going down this road, be open with this, your specialist about what you're doing. And, and as particularly if you're having the goal that, you know, I want this to be a sometimes thing, um, not an all the time thing, but I, but I also think that, you know, what specialists also are looking for is a restorative dentist that has the capacity to talk to patients about getting patients to accept implants. Mm -hmm. So, so again, I believe that 
when a procedure comes into a practice, the more we're thinking about it, the more it's going to happen, mm-hmm. whether it's in-house or out, uh, outside the practice. Right. And add some, add some color to the whole ethical conversation, because we talked about this before, you know, the ethics of this, because, you know, sometimes people don't listen and they'll just react. And so I think ethically, we've got a responsibility. Number one, just do the right thing. Number two, uh, pay attention to the trends. Um, can you just add some color to that? Well, I just think ethically, there is, is just isn't any bones about the fact that if you do a procedure on a patient, whether it's ortho, implants, taking out third molars, IV sedation, whatever it is, if you're going beyond the scope of usual and customary general dentistry, we need to know that if something goes wrong, we are going to be sitting there being judged by not general dentists, but by specialists. I mean, they will be the ones that are uh, at the hearing and all that. So we have to be as good or maybe not better than the standard of care at the specialist. So everything has got to go well. That's the, that's the bottom line. So, so ethically, I have no problem with any dentist that's been trained to do a procedure and can do it as well mm-hmm. as a specialist. And again, this is a, just throwing it out there, but this is the reality of it. I've seen a lot of implants placed by specialists that aren't great. So it's not like, it's not like if just because you have a specialist degree that you're going to be put a hundred percent of the implants in perfect a hundred percent of the time. It's right. the same thing with orthodontics. One of the things that's driving Invisalign is because a lot of people, um, aren't always a hundred percent satisfied with the occlusal result that comes from orthodontists. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say all orthodontists, but, but. The reality is with the technology that we have today in orthodontics, when you went to school years and years ago, a lot of the the skill was in actually bending the wire. Mm -hmm. Well, pushing teeth around isn't as difficult as it used to be. The difficulty is in treatment planning. So the Mm -hmm. best orthodontists are are good treatment planners and and pick the the right cases. Um, Today, implant surgery used to be that what was really difficult about implant surgery, it wasn't very predictable because we didn't have cone beam and you had to flap and the design and all the things that would be able to graft on, a, on the fly. Well, with some of the technology we have today, there are cases that are slam dunks with guided surgery. So the trends are being driven by the fact that we do have technological advances that make some of these things easier. And so just as long as the general dentist is understanding what they're getting into and they're going to be doing it at the level of the specialist, I personally think that these type of trends, again, this might be a little controversial, but I think these type of trends only push the envelope of quality even higher. Right. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Right. And you're heavily involved with all the technology and the thinking process around the future. What do you, what, what can we expect to see in the next couple of years? I mean, everyone can only guess, but I'd love to know what you think we will see in the next two to three to five years. Well, there's always the, I mean, there's always the, the, the crazy outliers, but, but I don't right. think that there's any trend that more and more we're going to be going to, um, modelless type surgery. In other words, no impressions, everything's going to be scanned, everything's going to be merged into uh, a cone beam, and we're going to be doing more and more things completely guided. Um, you know, that's already happening at the highest level, but there isn't any question that that seems to be the easiest way for us to relate the tooth position to the proposed implant and actually get the implant there. Mm -hmm. Um, as I said, some of the, I've talked about it already and and I want to be clear, I'm no financial, you know, um, compensation of implant concierge, but I'm so impressed with where that company's going because it's taking a lot of the things that we're talking about, um, and making it so easy for either a dentist to work by themselves or for an interdisciplinary team to make a plan, get on a go-to meeting with their planner and everybody make the decisions like that Mm -hmm. and then have guides and custom healing abutments or provisionals all fabricated without even an impression being taken other than a digital scan. It's pretty cool. So, so I think that's going to be where it is. I, I just think that as we go down the road, 
more and more, we're going to have to fly by the seat of our pants a whole lot less. And, mm -hmm. and that's really where, if you think about great implantologists 20, 25 years ago, I mean, they were cowboys. I mean, mm -hmm. they were doing stuff that was just, you know, there was just wasn't near the, the technology and you had to just have, <laughs> you had a lot of test testicular fortitude to be doing some of the things they were doing. Right. Um, today, I think we have a much better handle on first planning, tooth, gum position, then putting the implant in, and then making a realistic decision about what we should be doing and what we shouldn't. And the second here, we'll talk about um, that green, yellow, red concept, the concepts that we do and the concepts we stay away from. Yeah. Any other con considerations that you would say are pretty important before we go into the green, yellow, red? I think it's just going to fall right into this. I mean, I think for the general uh, practitioner, what everybody wants to know is what are the optimum clinical conditions that I look for? Right. And if we go to slide 12, we can start talking about that. Okay. okay. So number three in steps to implementing the implant surgeon as a GP, we want to look for those optimum clinical decision or, or conditions. And what I look for is good attached tissue and adequate bone that's in the right place. So I, as a GP, my comfort level, I don't like to have to take away a lot of bone or add a lot of bone. So I'm going to think from incisal edge, free gingival margin, and then allowing for that three to four millimeters of depth. And so if we look at what kind of cases that to begin with, um, again, the green, yellow patient, green, yellow, red, if we go to slide 13, um, the green patient is the one with adequate bone, adequate attached tissue, thick periotypes, premolars are awesome. Premolars mm -hmm. are great ones to begin with. Anterior mandible is great. And then my preference is to do open or closed guided surgery. And I'll show you what these surgical guides look like. Mm -hmm. But honestly, if we're doing guided surgery and with one of the kits, um, if we've done all the work in advance, you know, what Pete said, Pete said it best. He said, it looks like an orangutan could have put that implant in. And it's kind of how <laughs> it is. And the guy's <laughs> solid in there. Uh, that's, a, that's, if you know Pete, that's so great. Right. Uh, and then the yellow patient is the maxillary anterior with optimum bone and periotype. So the maxillary anterior can be risky for sure. Um, but again, if you think about some of the training that I had with my periodontist about really understanding papillas and, and sh holding those papillas intact, the surgery when the bone is optimum isn't that difficult up there. It's when the bone is missing or the tissues trash that it becomes difficult. So again, Optimum bone, optimum pterotype. And then the red red patients for me are insufficient bone, insufficient tish, attached tissue, thin periotypes. And a thin periotype for me is if we put a probe in the sulcus and I can see the probe through the sulcus, I don't touch that one. Um, hmm. Patients needing IV sedation, so really anxious patients, um, I don't mess with. And of course, these full arch implant cases um, or just big implant cases where there's going to be a lot of tabling of bone or grafting. You know, those are the type of cases that I'm working with my team on. Um, so again, if we look at sort of the green is a no-brainer. The yellows, we're looking at a little more carefully. Uh, but again, it probably accounts for about 30 to 40% of the mm -hmm. implants that I, that I put out. So let's look at some examples. If we go to slide 14. Um, slide 14 is a great one. I've got the the little circle there on the cusp tip of the lower premolar, just to remind you to watch out for that because that plunger cusp can mess up the occlusion. But when we look at this patient, she's got gobs of attached tissue. She's got a nice broad ridge. Um, when we plan the case from incisal ledge to free gingival margin and bone, this is a patient that I can pretty much um, do guided. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was an older case uh, where I didn't have guided surgical capabilities for that at that time, but we still had cone beam and we could, if you go to slide 15, uh, plan where our implant's going to go. And, and I could see that if I just followed the root contours or, or the crowns of the teeth adjacent, um, that I'm going to be safe. And mm -hmm. so with that going to slide 16, uh, putting the implant in that position place properly, um, putting in our sulcus former, um, you know, it's a fairly good one. Um, we want to make sure that we're staying about three millimeters away from adjacent teeth. 
I'm sorry, two millimeters away from adjacent teeth and about three millimeters away from another implant. That's another sort of the trend that we're, we're looking for. Okay. Uh, but premolars are great. Let's look at uh, slide 17 as another example, uh, which is a more difficult situation where we've got a patient who's losing tooth number eight, uh, has some bone loss. And one of the things that, that we've gotten pretty good at uh, going to slide 18 is transitioning that area to something that has bone. Now, I'm showing the implant going in, but what happened between slide 17 and 18 was we extracted the tooth and, and we basically um, used the root of the tooth. We packed the, the area, we cleaned it out with, with bone and, and uh, the dynablast material, made a membrane with gel foam, and then basically just bonded the tooth in position after cutting the root off. Um, waited five months and then came back and put the implant in. So grafting to me, a simple socket grafting procedure can take a red case and turn it into a yellow case. And that's sort of what we did with this case. Um, going to slide 19, you can see this is how we just bonded the patient's own tooth in place and kept some of the root form there to support the papilla. And then if we go to slide 20, we can see, I'm oh, sorry, go back to slide 19. Uh, um, notice that when we take the provisional off, how you can see the implant in the base of that socket and how we've been able to manage and create that perfect sulcular epithelium. Now we can go to slide 20. And again, taking a case where you've got a lot of bone loss to that second picture where we're using the root of the tooth bonded to the adjacent teeth to hold the bone graft to then placing the implant, shaping the tissues. So if, again, if you're a young doc and you're thinking about placing implants up and you haven't even done a lot of bridge work to change the shape of tissues and all, that's what concerns me because 95% right. of it, well, maybe not 90% of it, but a lot of it is maintaining those tissues so that we can get a great result as we go through. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot to think about. Um, gosh, as far as, well, again, I, I keep going back to protocols or processes. Um, what are some questions to consider for younger dentists watching this? Like what, it, it, you know, anything else that you would, you'd say, Hey, look, this is a clear consideration you need to ask yourself as you look at the, look at the future and maybe doing some of this. Well, I, I, I think as a young dentist, I, I do think that I'm, I'm a firm believer that this is going to happen. I mean, right. I, I think that as we move forward, you know, I mentioned last time I have a daughter who actually is finishing her first week of dental or first year of dental school this week at University of Louisville. Um, and I, as I look at her and, and I, I look at the young dentist that's, that's in my practice now, um, there isn't any question that the way they're thinking, they're definitely thinking about all these procedures as things they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, if you look at the residencies, if they, they go to a general practice residency or an AEGD, they're placing implants. I mean, they're learning how to do these procedures. So to think that that's going to stop, it's not going to stop. What I ask them though, is to just what I, the trend that I'm most concerned about is the trend towards just learning procedures. Sticking an implant in bone is not that difficult. It's not that challenging. But sticking an implant in bone so that you're going to have it in an optimum position right. so that the crown and the custom abutment and everything's going to be in the right place at the end is challenging. Mm -hmm. so, so as we move down this road, we get back to the ethics. What I just implore young dentists to do, no matter how much debt that they've got stacked on top of themselves is to just begin with that honest ethical question whether they have all the pieces in the you know all the pieces in place to to, to get a good result mm -hmm. and a lot of times when you do the implant training you're pretty much being taught to drill this hole and use this spur and put it in like this but there's not a lot of discussion about the things we're talking about about mm -hmm. smile design and about occlusal design and specifically about where that teeth goes, the tooth goes first. So that's where I think 
You certainly can do additional training to learn that. Dawson is a great place to go to learn those things. But you can learn a heck of a lot at a study club, and you can learn a lot by hanging out with the right specialist and finding a good mentor. Yeah. Um, it's and, just, and I, I want to ask you about that, too, because mentors non-negotiable in this industry or this profession. You have to have mentors, and you have to choose them. And also study clubs. I mean, I love the idea, and I absolutely insist our, all the young ones have to get in mature ones have to be in a study club. What happens or in two, a study club? One or two. Or two. Yeah. Yeah. Now you guys, Dawson has its, its study clubs. What happens inside of a study? If no one's ever been a part of a study club, how does it work? So what's kind of cool about our study club is that, um, when somebody joins our study club, we, we typically want our doctors to be interested in our core curriculum or in our core curriculum or have completed our core curriculum. So somebody joins our study club, they immediately get seminar one online. So just like that, they become sort of an alum of ours and they can go and do their two and a half days of training online. And the, 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 the whole goal of the study club, um, kind of my little brainchild about five years ago was we did it. We beta tested it first in Virginia. We had about 20 docs from around the country coming in. And what I wanted to see was if we took the, our protocol, like you're talking about our protocol, our study club, or, or how we'd work up a case. And we had them come in and we had the models there and we had the photographs and we had the x-rays and we just allowed them to go through case treatment planning following our checklist and we could throw say six cases at them in a year would they improve right. well they certainly did but what it evolved to after that was not everybody always only want to do treatment planning and so we're constantly doing interactive lectures we just did one on where and we were doing one on um, anterior implants and um, case uh practice management type topics. But typically what's happening is you got anywhere from, we have one study club that meets completely online, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a bunch of them that are anywhere from 10 all the way up to 20, 25 docs that get together and formats different, but it, it, it basically accounts for about six days a year. Um, some people might spread that out over a few more evenings or be more half days where they meet once a month for half day, but they can design it however they want to design it. And right. so the study club leaders, um, you know, what we tell everybody, the way it's designed, because everything is coming from our online portal, um, they don't have to be educators. We, we like to say they, they don't have to be Johnny Carson, just Ed McMahon. They just have to right. kind of, kind of be able to lead and welcome everybody and, and create the structure. Uh, but it's tremendously exciting. We, at our alumni meeting, um, I think you were there for part of study club day. Were you there for part of study? I was not. That was oh, the first day. To, yeah. 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 So, so at our alumni meeting, the alumni meeting goes Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Thursday is study club day. So everybody mm -hmm. that is in study club is coming in a day early. They get a day, day of C included in that. But I, I'm becoming absolutely convinced watching the do our doctors that are committing to our core and in a study club, they learn at light speed because, mm -hmm. because they're, it's constantly being reinforced. And there's a little bit of uh, just, just peer pressure, if you want to say it, but there's just a little bit of um, camaraderie and just growth and maybe, and maybe even doctors getting together and realizing that some of the challenges that they have aren't unique to them. And so they figure out ways through some of the implementation barrier barricades together. Right. It's really cool. I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably most proud of that right now, watching that study club thing take off. Yeah, it's crazy cool. And I heard this right in that room with you guys, you know, you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together, go together. And that's really the collaborative Amen. experience. Now, I've got, I'm going to ask you the tough questions that I get, which is this one. You know, I, I've I've always wanted to go to the Dawson Academy, but you know, what if I'm already an established dentist? Do I have to go back to the beginning? And you're doing, you know, you've got some advanced courses like uh, you're you're now there's an all on four course that you guys teach. Can you just give us some perspective sure. if I'm so, going to make a decision? So, yeah. So I, I think if it's a young doctor, a young doctor um, that is trying to take his general practice and do cooler stuff. You know, mm -hmm. they want to do some veneer cases. They want to do some bigger restorative cases. They want to be able to solve wear problems. 
then that's the doctor that just needs to sign up for the core curriculum. And the sooner they can go through the seven classes and implement their those protocols, and again, it's not for all their patients, but it's for the patient that has more advanced problems, the worn dentition, the occlusion where they're breaking a cusp off, the patient that wants veneers, the patient that needs some more major crown and bridge. The problem with that patient is we weren't really trained. You can't just prep and pray. You have to figure out where the teeth go and do a wax up and work things out in the temps. And, and that's what that's all about. For the docs that have been other places and, and are working at a really high level that want to see what we do, but don't want to reinvent the wheel, then I'd say go to, to our advanced core curriculum or our advanced curriculum. Um, we've got several classes available. The all on four class will happen this fall. There's a, a class on vertical dimension where we talk about opening verticals. Um, whether you're doing it all at once, we show a cool technique that if you need to open the vertical dimension by placing little tops on the teeth, sort of temporaries, long-term temps, we teach that technique in that class. Um, there is uh, the airway class that I know you've had wit on and uh, sort of the, the medical dental connection. Drew Cobb has an amazing class on TMD and, and sort of restoring the TMD patient. So I think those types of classes, if you go online, you can look at that, but that will allow you to kind of dive into something that's more complex, but also see how it's founded in what we do. Right. That's awesome. And so if you haven't gone, like I said, just check it out and go, you know, I, you have to go. But if you don't want to go, you can also start with a simple thing like online just to kick the tires because some people want to kick the tires sometimes. Now, if I want to get a hold of you and ask you a, you a question, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, so my email, uh, smiledoc, uh, S-M-I-L-D-O-C, I forgot the E like 30 years ago. And I am the last AOL user in the planet. So it's smildoc at AOL.com, smildoc at AOL.com. Yeah, you are the single last user yeah. on the But planet. everybody has it, so how do you change? I can't figure right. out how to change. But Do you still hear that you forgot me? Do they do that anymore? No, anymore? I don't think they do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's awesome. Buddy, I am so crazy grateful, and this is just one of many, many, many topics you and I are going to explore. And like I said, I just love your authenticity, your willingness to go where people sometimes don't want to go, and just give us very thoughtful considerations on all sides. And so people can... Um, make come to their own conclusions. So, um, it's awesome. Awesome. I really appreciate this brother. So, right. uh, Hey, wait, hold on. Don't leave yet. Um, I want to talk to you for just a little bit, but I'm going to say, we'll say goodbye to everybody else. But Hey, for those of you watching, uh, I really, really appreciate it. And again, we're just so grateful you're watching. Please add a question to the feed. Even if you're watching this after the live broadcast, I want to make sure Dr. Cranham gets back to you and he'll give you a great answer for some of the questions you might have. And then uh, also um, keep giving us suggestions for great shows. We've got so many of them. I'm going to try to do the best we can to get them all done. Uh, and until we see you next time, keep watching the best practice show. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.